Hello, everyone. Semi-retired Bob here. I talk about the carnivore diet, all things related to the carnivore diet, and miscellaneous odds and ends. Have I got a special treat for you today? This is the one a few of you have been waiting for. Without dragging this out any longer, I want to say welcome to our guest today, and I hope you learn as much as I did in talking with this gentleman. Welcome, Professor K. Welcome, Professor Kay. I'm very glad to have you on my channel today. Um, I can't imagine that anyone watching my channel does not know who you are, but just in case somebody's just walked in out of the trees, would you mind taking a few moments and introducing yourself, who you are and what your background is? Sure. My name is Bart Kay, and I am, I guess, what you'd call a former professor of or a retired professor of health science and i specialized in a 25 year career or so in researching teaching and consulting with folks externally regarding exercise physiology or the physiology of rest and exercise if you like um cardiovascular pathophysiology so heart disease atherosclerosis, that kind of stuff, and human nutrition. Um, I also have secondary specializations in pure and applied statistics, statistical methodology and inference. So uh, all in all, it's kind of a, um, a reasonably well-rounded package, I guess, of, of knowledge and experience in health science generally. So that's my background. And then about five years ago, I retired from all of that because I wasn't enjoying it anymore and decided to be a YouTube influencer and creator of videos for your viewing and uh, educational entertainment pleasure instead. Much more fun. That's me in a nutshell. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I did think of one quick thing before I get into the things that I had planned. I, um, you are obviously a guru when it comes to the Randall cycle. Sure. I have a channel that I try to break everything down into simple retired truck driver terms. Mm -hmm. So I would like, I would like your opinion of what I've been saying to my elderly crowd, the things we need to understand about the Randall cycle, Randall sure. cycle, mm -hmm. fat, good carbohydrates, bad fat and carbohydrates together. Truly terrible. Yeah. Is that, is, does that about sum it up? Yeah. I mean, uh, the knowledge behind it, absolutely, we can get into if you want to. But in a nutshell, for the take-home message, what do people need to understand what you've just said spot on? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, again, I have the general demographics of my channel are my age, which is 60 years old and beyond. I have many people in their high 70s and low 80s that comment on my videos regularly. Um, one of the things that they get sucked into a lot is they like to watch a lot of different YouTubers because they're my age, they're at home a lot, do it with nothing to do but watching YouTube videos and uh, the occasional walk outside. And there are several people out there um, advocating for plants. What are your thoughts on specifically as it pertains to my demographic on adding mm -hmm. plants to their diet. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it really doesn't matter what your age or stage is. That which is ideal indicated health promoting for human beings throughout the lifespan is pretty similar in terms of dietary intake. Okay, when you are an infant, mother's milk is ideal until you're weaned, if you can possibly get that. Thereafter, the diet for a human remains pretty well unchanged throughout the rest of the lifespan after that point. The idea that we've all been taught, myself included, because you know I'm in my early 50s now, and I grew up in the same, um, I guess, era in terms of what we were being told nutritionally, and it's still going on today with young people today. It's not changed. However, it's been wrong the whole time. 
there's an idea that balance was good in your diet. No, balance is not good. Human beings, like every other animal on the planet, are a specialist. We have evolved in a niche. We have an ideal means for us physiologically by which we gain nutrition. And it turns out that human beings are absolutely unequivocally obligate hyper carnivores. The eating of plant material is a fallacy in terms of it being good for us. No, it isn't. Plants are full of toxins designed to discourage animals from eating them. They're full of anti-nutrients, meant to bind the nutrient in those plants up and make them unavailable for animals that eat them. They are pro-inflammatory. They are damaging to the gut function, the colonic function. There is a laundry list of reasons why you should absolutely not eat plants at all. No plants. There are no plants that are good for you. There are some compounds found in plants which have been shown mechanistically in a reductionist fashion to maybe have benefits in certain aspects, but they're always offset by the deleterious nature of the poisons, the anti-nutrients, the pro-inflammatory nonsense that you'll find with plant materials. The thing about a plant is it's rooted to the spot. It cannot run away from you, dive into a pond, fly away, hide under a rock, it's just sat there. And as such, it needs a strategy to discourage animals from eating it. Most plant toxins are designed to kill insects rapidly, effectively, on the spot, and they do, a lot of them. However, those toxins are not usually powerful enough in many plants to kill a human stone dead on the spot. But they will nonetheless kill you slowly and surely over decades and in the meantime, destroy your quality of life and your health span while they're at it. So in short, if you're looking for scientific evidence, scientific studies concerning nutrition science and human beings, you will find a bunch of stuff published in the literature that purports to be nutrition science done by a fraternity of scientists called nutrition scientists. It's all ideology. It's all spin doctory, propaganda, smoke and mirrors, fear mongery. It's all bought and paid for. None of it's actually science. The science that informs us on how a human works is put together and how a human should feed itself is really, you'd have to look at the anthropology, the organ systems, the metabolic pathway studies, enzyme studies, those kind of things that inform us on how a human being really does work. When you do that, all the evidence points in the same direction and it tells us human beings have, for the last 350,000 years in our current form as humans, eaten almost nothing but the flesh and fat of large ruminant animals with very little plant material at all and only then as, as a subsistence survival food when the hunt was unsuccessful. Before that 350,000 years, up to about four and a half million years ago, the diet was very, very similar in species that were very nearly human, but not yet quite humans. So there's a long, long history of selection for the eating of meat and animal fat. Then what happened about 11,000 years ago is humans got it into their, into their heads, an idea that a good idea would be to grow a whole bunch of grasses and eat their seeds for food instead of all the animals that we've been eating, which were now less available because of ecological things that were going on, like the thawing of the ice ages and a lot of plants growing and all that kind of stuff. And we changed our diet about 11,000 years ago and it was absolutely disastrous for our health in every way. Human beings are now shorter, weaker, less robust, have smaller skeletons, our dental arches are all cramped up, our jaws have atrophied, um, our intelligence is less than it was apparently 11,000 years ago as well, our immune systems are weakened, compromised, etc. And our lifespan, our natural lifespan, um, seems to have been foreshortened as well. Though we live longer through technology than we did, our biologically determined lifespan is less. So, yeah, in a nutshell, plants, bad, meat and fat, animal fat, that is good. Yep. Seed oils, absolutely not. Never, ever touch seed oils. Never go anywhere near seed oils. 
there you go. There's the whole um, the whole position statement, really. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about a few of the myths that are out there espoused by, as I call them on my channel, the other side of the aisle. Because if so, the number one myth that we hear all the time, vitamin C. Um, yep. How is your scurvy today, Professor? I'm very concerned about you. Yes, yes. Eight and a half years ago, I started a basically, to all intents and purposes, fully carnivorous diet. So uh, roughly eight and a half years ago, less about six weeks, because uh, scurvy will kill you in about six weeks, uh, I, I actually died. Uh, no one's had the heart to tell me that I died of scurvy about eight and a half years ago. And as such, I continue along my merry way, just pretending that I don't have scurvy and imagining that I don't have scurvy and imagining that I didn't die of scurvy about eight and a half years ago. It's been quite lucky for me. That's a real bonus. It's a real bane to have this extra eight and a half years of, of apparently, uh, in my mistaken view, healthy life. Uh, beyond beyond the beyond the scourge of, of, of scurvy, as it were. Uh, I could also introduce you to a friend of mine called Richard Rodriguez, who has been eating a carnivore diet for 40 years. And as such, of course, died 40 years ago from scurvy. And recently we've been made aware of another wonderful woman who's actually still a full-time rancher, working full-time on a ranch in her early 80s who went carnivore 67 years ago. And again, nobody's told her either that she died of scurvy 67 years ago. And that's been a real bonus for her. And I hope no one does tell her that uh, and disabuses her of that false notion of her death 67 years ago, because that would really curtail her life, I think, as it, as it um, continues in her false belief that she is in fact completely scurvy free. As is everybody else we've ever spoken to across any race, creed, or nation that they come from who is similarly unaffected by scurvy on an entirely meat-based diet. So uh, that's the anecdotes. Uh, for the science, here it goes. The transporter which gets vitamin C out of your blood and into your cells where it's required to do its work is one called GLUT4, which you've probably heard of before. It's the exact same one that transports, transports sugar from your bloodstream into your cells. Think of it like two fat men trying to push their way through a revolving door at once, and it's all jammed up. Also, imagine the sugar as the fatter of the two fat men and vitamin C as the thinner of the two fat men. And as such, the sugar elbows, shoulders, and basically pushes the thinner of the two fat men, the vitamin C, out of the way so that it can't get anywhere near the door. So if you are a person who eats fruits, vegetables, plant material of any kind, anything containing starch, basically, what you'll find is the sugar in your bloodstream will always be shouldering the vitamin C out of the way. And as such, you need a vastly higher amount of, uh, of vitamin C in your blood so that any of it can get into your cells at all. Um, so the, the RDIs, the RDAs, the required amounts, so-called, for vitamin C and the milligrams per deciliter of blood range are vastly inflated by that sugar intake that human beings inappropriately are doing largely. Turns out a carnival person requires a blood concentration in the nanograms range of vitamin C to get sufficient into their cells and prevent scurvy and all that kind of stuff. Also turns out that that's about the amount that they will find naturally in the red meat of large ruminant animals. It's almost as if we've been doing that for four and a half million years and our bodies have evolved for that purpose. Further to that, Many animals produce their own vitamin C. They have an enzyme that means they can create vitamin C themselves. That gene is absent in human beings, entirely absent. The only way a gene ever gets knocked out, removed entirely from a gene pool, is if it's deleterious, problematic, and would cause the death of that individual before they can pass their genes on. It's... it's genes don't just disappear because they're no longer necessarily useful. They have to be wiped out before they will be eliminated. 
and the gene for vitamin C production in humans is gone. There is not one human being alive that has that gene. That means the ability to make vitamin C was really very seriously problematic. Once we came down from the trees, stopped eating fruit, and started living on meat instead. Now, a lot of people say, well, what would that be? Well, here's my theory. This is not proven fact or science in any way, but it makes sense to me. Maybe it goes up your flagpole, maybe it doesn't. Here it is. When you stop eating sugars in the form of fruits, your need for vitamin C drops vastly, as I've just described in terms of that transporter issue. Therefore, you are, if you are making your own vitamin C, making vastly more than your body now needs. A lot of people say, well, that's not a problem because extra vitamin C, be, vitamin C being water soluble, will just be urinated out. And that's true. Most of the excess vitamin C is, is urinated out when you have too much, but not all of it. Some of it is metabolized and it's metabolized to a different substance. Do you know what that is, Bob, perchance? Um, I do not. Okay, it is oxalate. Ah, that I've heard of. Right. Oxalate will kill you if you have too much oxalate in your system. The most common way that oxalate expresses when there's too much of it is kidney stones. But that's not to say that calcium oxalate crystals can't form anywhere in your body. They can anywhere in your tissues. And when you think of kidney stones, because they're called stones, you think of something smooth and round like a pebble? No. <laughs> kidney stones are sharp, needle-like structures, star-like formations that puncture cells, pierce tissues, really, really nasty stuff. Um, these crystals can form anywhere in your body, including in your eyeballs or in your urinary system in the terms of you know kidney stones, etc. Uh, in any of your tissues, including in your bones, you know, really, really bad stuff. Um, so maybe humans came down from the trees, stopped eating so much sugar, didn't need so much vitamin C, continued to make it. And basically the, the people that were highly expressing this gene were dying off before they could mate with other humans and pass those genes on because it was killing them. Thus it wiped it out. Excellent. That's my theory. Mm. I also have a theory on brontosauruses, by the way. <laughs> like this they are very very skinny at one end much much fatter in the middle and very very thin again at the other end prove me wrong <laughs> mm. um i would i would not begin to attempt to prove you wrong on anything professor good you better not because it's hate speech it is it is <laughs> um the next thing i wanted to talk about because i know i've been a little bit uncomfortable i've been doing this for just under a year now so okay. I'm wondering what I can expect after, in your experience, at now eight years without ever having gone to the bathroom because you don't eat fiber. Exactly, yes. So what I'm can I expect? Dreadfully, dreadfully, yes, dreadfully backed up. Eight years ago, it was a lot, eight and a half years ago, was the time I last moved my bowels, of course, because of my lack of fiber. Everyone knows if you don't eat fiber, you, you can't go number twos. Wrong again. Uh, Richard Rodriguez, 40 years ago, he had his last bowel movement, so he's well backed up. Uh, and and our, our good friend, whose name eludes me at the moment, who's who's been carnivore for 67 years. Well, you, you that's that's some severe stoppage, isn't it? 67 years without going to the bathroom. No, you don't need fiber to go to the bathroom. Is the short uh, the short version of that whatsoever? In fact, if anything. Fiber will compromise the ability of you to have good bowel function and to have a good healthy bowel system going on there because precisely fiber is mechanically damaging to your gut. It's not supposed to be there. It's indigestible. Um, we do not have the fermentative capacity of our closest relatives that, that do live on largely herbivorous diets such as gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, those kind of animals. By the way, feed any one of those animals some meat and it will happily yum it down, thanks very much. They are not herbivorous animals strictly. They can and do eat meat. In fact, chimpanzees hunt monkeys in, in packs as an adjunct to their 
you know, we see all these documentaries with orangutans sitting around reasonably peacefully pruning each other and going ah, 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 and munching on leaves and fruit. They also hunt monkeys and eat those too. So don't be fooled. Excellent, excellent. I did not know that either. But mm. if I'm learning something, hopefully everybody watching my channel is learning something as well. Um, mm. I hope so too. Yeah. I have long posited that um, if you look at it as an individual, if I were to go out, if I was an ancient being and had gone out and killed myself a great big animal, Mm -hmm. I was the only one that had to eat it, and it wasn't going to go bad. Mm -hmm. That because of the ratios of organs to the muscle meat and the fat, there would yeah. be very, very little organ for me to eat over the life span of that animal. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on organs? Organs are something that humans can eat to the right proportion as you've correctly identified there, Bob. Um, and as you also correctly identified there, you, what generally happened was as a tribe, humans would take down a large megafauna beast. And they used to do that, Bob, by diving at it headlong with their mouths open so that they could tear its throat open with their sharp pointy teeth and claws. Again, no, look at the cave paintings. You'll see the hunting men had sharp pointy sticks. We didn't need those. That's why we don't have them. Our teeth are largely like frugivorous teeth. You'll see these, the, 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 those that come from that church of that thing that we're not mentioning. Um, they'll say, oh, we can't possibly be carnivores because look at our jaws and teeth. They're, they're those of a frugivorous animal. Yes, because that's where we evolved from about 5 million years ago. And there was no selection pressure to cause our teeth shape to change i have never bob in my life of 50 something years 51 i have never sat down to the kitchen table and said to whoever provided that lovely steak for me i'm sorry the steak looks and smells wonderful it's absolutely the best food for a human being but i can't eat it because you see i don't have sharp pointy teeth like this no, I have a knife and a fork. And I have never had a problem eating meat and neither have any of my ancestors, clearly, because we are here. Okay, so there's that. But let's get back to organs. All right. Think of a cattle beast. Let's imagine that there's two or 300 kilograms of edible muscle meat on that beast. How much does the liver, for example, of a cow weigh? Maybe two know, kilograms. Yeah, maybe, maybe two a kilograms. Pound and a half or two. Something like that. So the ratio there is quite clear. And that is the ratio if you're going to eat liver that you should eat liver at with comparison to muscle meat. Why do I say that? What's wrong with liver? Everyone says liver is full of vitamin A and vitamin C, which you don't need much of anyway. And also, you know, it's it's full of all sorts of elements and things that you need. Well, you do need all of those things, but you need them in the right proportion for you metabolically in your diet. Too much of anything is a, is a bad thing, including water, oxygen. All of those things can kill you as well if you have too much of them. Okay? You need the right amount, the amount that you are biologically designed by millions of years of selection pressure to, to, uh, to operate optimally on. The problem, uh, a lot of people say the problem with too much liver is vitamin A toxicity. I don't buy it. I don't see that as a problem myself. I don't, I've never come across someone with bona fide vitamin A toxicity. What we do come across though is people who suffer problems by eating too much liver in terms of their um, micronutrient, their, their minerals. The major problem is copper. Copper is concentrated in liver to such a level that it's toxic and it will disturb your electrolyte balance, your physiological function. It leads to all sorts of problems like an inability to maintain electrolytes at all, the flushing of electrolytes from your system, muscle cramps, Paul Saladino, um, muscle cramps in your heart, 
i.e. palpitations, Paul Saladino, disturbances to your sleep patterns, Paul Saladino, and all sorts of other problems like that, Paul Saladino. All right. Especially if you get into business with a bloke who purports not to be on steroids, although he obviously is, take one look at him, and now has admitted that. Gosh, we're so surprised. And you get into bed business-wise with that bloke and you start selling freeze-dried liver supplements for millions of dollars, Paul Saladino, that can run you into problems. I can't think of anyone that might have had any of those problems, Paul Saladino, but it does happen. Um to people who are misinformed and who think themselves expert in fields that they are not, for example. Um, so you, you ought to stay away from eating too much liver is the take home message. You should eat a very small amount of liver if you're going to at all. Um, I don't personally eat liver at all. I think it's revolting, frankly. Also, if you look at the Inuit, for example, who live on pretty much nothing but meat and blubber, if you see footage of Inuit sitting down together to share the spoils, a seal, for example, they'll cut the seal open, they'll cut the blubber into cubes and dish those out. They'll dish out the meat evenly amongst the hunting men, and then they'll rip out the entrails, chuck it on the floor and say to the dogs, go for it. Interesting, isn't it? The Inuit know. Not a problem for dogs. Dogs are evolved on eating the entrails and things first and foremost. That's a prize for them. It's a great synergistic partnership. The dogs do well on the organs. People don't. Interesting. So that's my take on organs. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Yes. Um... Most, most organs are okay, by the way, Bob. It's just liver that really is the issue. So if you want to eat brains, ears, noses, and bum holes, go for it. It's not my problem. Yeah. But stay away from liver. Yeah, I actually don't, because of all the bad information I got back in 1983 about my gout, the very first mm. thing at the top of the list was don't eat organ meats. Yeah. Um, for all the wrong reasons, but I still don't like them today, so I mm. don't. But I have several yeah. people that do. Um, mm. And speaking of that person that wasn't named several times there, yep. I have a, a real problem with certain doctors on the interwebs because they have the word doctor in their name people flock yeah. to them and listen to them yeah. um can we talk very briefly about fruit and honey and why it's contraindicated for humans sure. you bet absolutely fruit and honey ostensibly in terms of nutrient that a human being can derive from those things, the nutrient that is available is sugar. It's glucose and it's fructose, basically. Over three and a half, well, four and a half million years, probably largely, and certainly over the last 350,000 almost exclusively, humans have evolved consuming a diet which is devoid of sugars starches carbohydrates largely why because it wasn't available the earth was glaciated for most of that time frozen over sheets of ice miles of foot miles and miles thick plant material wasn't there to be had to speak of um we were able to live in a small area a small range of latitudes mostly around the equator where there was some small plants and shrubs and scrubs and things that animals largely could live on. And we lived on those animals that lived on those, those plants, most of those plants being hugely, vastly toxic, if not immediately, uh, certainly over a, over a span of time to people. The other thing is that most fruit and vegetables currently available that you can buy, most of those are a human invention of the last 150 years or so, selective breeding, etc. They did not exist in in ancient times even beyond more than 150 years ago most of them or they did exist some of these things but in vastly hugely different forms that's for another day um basically what what it boils down to is that because of the destitution of carbohydrate available to humans nutritionally we evolved 
a metabolic pathway by which we could produce all the glucose we require for all metabolic processes. There are certain tissues in your body that need glucose and will not survive without glucose. You must have some glucose in your blood at all times. For example, your brain must have glucose and testes are another example of a tissue that must have glucose and fructose actually, as it turns out. So as such, your body has evolved a methodology to produce that glucose and fructose from non-glucose and fructose sources. And what do we use? We use some amino acids, some proteins, but mostly, in fact, we use the glycerol backbones of fatty acid molecules. When you break down a fat molecule to oxidize the fatty acid chains that come off that, there's a backbone left behind, and it's that that we use to make sugar with, mostly, actually. It's, it's, it's a glycerol backbone. And, and so we do. And our body produces exactly the right amount of glucose, and it's really stable. It keeps that blood level of glucose really, really stable if you eat a diet which is devoid of carbohydrate. If you start eating carbohydrate, which we've only been doing at all for about 11,000 years, and more and more so over the last couple of hundred, what happens is you rapidly, vastly, hugely dump glucose into your bloodstream at a level that you are biologically completely unable to deal with. It's toxic. It will kill you. And as such, that causes your body to um, basically blockade that glucose from entering your cells like your muscles and your, and your very important cells that would use that material normally. We have to lock that door to protect that cell from the damage that the excess high level of glucose would cause to that cell. It's called the Randall cycle. We've alluded to it earlier, basically. That's what it's for. That's why it exists. That's what it does. The sacrificial lamb becomes your red blood cells and the epithelial cells of your vascular tree, i.e. your blood vessels. So what you end up with there is damage to your red blood cells. It's called HbA1c is the test for that. You've probably heard of that test. And further to that, you get damage to your epithelial cells, heart disease, atherosclerosis, inflammation, type 2 diabetes, many forms of cancer, most forms of dementia, all the big killers, basically. They're all down to consuming carbohydrates that you should not be consuming. Sugar in the form of glucose is quite damaging to your tissues above the normal natural level. Fructose, fruit sugar, is seven to 10 times worse than that in terms of the damaging ability it has on our tissues. The individual that we haven't already named several times, who is trained, by the way, as a psychiatrist and not as a nutritionist at all, by the way, um, and should stick to psychiatry for that reason. What he's doing by pouring up to 400 grams of carbohydrates in the form of both glucose and fructose down his stupid neck every day of his life, what he's doing is vastly, hugely, rapidly damaging his body. It's patent, actually. If you look at a video of that boy two years ago, he looks fit and young. He looks like a man of his age at that time, which was he was in his early 40s two years ago. He was 43 two years ago, and he looked like it. Today, he's 45, and most people who look at an image of him and put it beside an image of me say, whoa, we know which one is older, and they get it wrong because I'm in my early 50s and he's 45, and he looks a lot older. Yes. That's just opinion. It doesn't have to be anybody else's. I mean, you make your own, you make your own assessment of it. But even if you say, well, it's not apples and pears because you're not the same person, fine. Take a look at a picture of him when he was 43 and him two years later and tell me that that's two years worth of natural aging that's gone on. Crazy. It's, it's, it's inane. It's, it's yeah. It, there is no place in the human diet for the intake of exogenous sugar of any form. The exact dietary requirement for sugar in your diet is not one gram ever. The same as it is for fiber, none. Excellent. Excellent. I, um, I have one more topic that I'd like to go into that I've heard you know a little something about. 
Um, mm-hmm. Because I have always said on my channel that my primary supplement is eating beef. <clears throat> That's my primary supplement, and I add salt to it. But yep. recently I've found a product, and I'm told you know just a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see if I can make the camera find it here. Maybe not because, eh. I'll do it here. It's, it's you, can have, do it. you can have a see-through version of it because I've got a green screen. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Yes, I've, Ultra. I've been taking Stem Enhance Ultra plus three other products mm-hmm. by this same company. And yep. as I understand it, you are a bit of an expert on this product. Do you mind taking a few moments to explain what it is to my people? Absolutely. My pleasure and my, um, my solemn duty to do so because this is very, very important. In your bone marrow, every one of you, are a population of cells called adult stem cells. What are those? They are cells containing all of your DNA, all the instructions that make up you, in a blank cell format. These are a cell that are not specialized in any way. They're not what we call an adult cell line. Your heart cell is a specialized cell. The cells of your heart are specialized. The cells of your brain are specialized to be neurons. The cells in your skin are specialized to be skin, et cetera. These cells are blank. They can be anything at all except sperm or eggs. Probably a good thing in our age. We don't want any extra of those, frankly. Um, What do these cells do? They hang around in your bone marrow until they get a chemical message for some reason saying, release us, release us into the bloodstream. When they are released into the bloodstream, these adult stem cells will tool around in the blood for a bit and do magic things like exude first aid packages out to other cells, calm down inflammation, kill off cancer cells, all sorts of wonderful things like that, until they see, recognize cells and tissues in your body that are worn, tired, aged, dysfunctional, diseased, broken down, not working properly. Such damaged cells usually have flags on their cell membrane saying, I'm not working properly, come and replace me. And the adult stem cell says, I see your flag, I bind to you, stuck there, I dissolve the old cell out of the way and I differentiate and become a new adult skin cell, hair follicles, no, not hair follicle cells, doesn't work for those, Um, eyeball cells, heart cells, anything your body might actually need for health purposes. So not hair follicle cells, unfortunately, whatever. I'll get over it one day, Bob, maybe. I lost my hair when I was 28 and um, I've had time to get over it, I suppose. Right. Anyway, so adult stem cells, what do they do? They replace your tissues with new ones. Wow. How cool is that? Now, the other thing you need to understand about cells, adult cells in your body, is an adult cell will divide an X number of times. And then they stop dividing. Upon which those cells will age, and eventually they will crap out and die. And when enough of your cells have crapped out and died, so will you. We all will at some point. It's a fait accompli. What is it that determines how many times any given cell line will divide? It's a thing apparently called a telomere, which is a length of DNA on the end of each one of your chromosomes, X number of hundred base pairs long, whatever it is, X number of thousand. I think it is actually thousands, yeah. It's like the plastic thing on the end of a shoelace that stops the shoelace from fraying. Every time a cell divides, that telomere gets a little bit shorter. It's the biological clock. And when that telomere gets to a certain critical short length, that tells that cell line that it can't divide anymore. So it stops. That's one of the things that determines your lifespan as a human being. An adult stem cell, when it goes from your bone marrow, pulls around, does its magic, then binds to a cell and and replaces that cell with a new one, that new cell has a full length telomere. 
as a full length. It will divide as many times as it would have done had you just been born that day. That cell, that cell alone. So will this prevent you from dying? No, you still will at some point. However, that might be years and years later than you otherwise would have, potentially, depending on how many adult stem cells replace how many warm cells that you might have in your body. Maybe. That is not a therapeutic claim. This company has very rigorous rules, which are mandated to us by the jolly old FDA, and they will not allow us to make therapeutic claims. Quite rightly so, too. So we don't. All we do is tell you the science. That's what it is. Um, so if you have any kind of disease process born of years on the planet, wear and tear, dysfunction, disease process of any kind, even if that's pathological disease process, because one of the things adult stem cells can do is become more immune cells, by the way, then I would suggest to you that this product would be something that you should very, very seriously get yourself involved with taking religiously on a day-by-day -day basis. And I'd start doing that yesterday. I really would. Personally, I started taking this product 13 years ago when I was told by an eye specialist that I could expect to be legally blind within five years. 13 years ago, I was told that. I'm not legally blind, by the way. I can see fine. In fact, my eyesight's better than it was 13 years ago. It's almost as if something's happened, which I'm not allowed to make any kind of therapeutic claim about whatsoever, so I'm not, except I'm not blind. That's a fact. So either the best eye specialist in the country in which I live is an imbecile and was wrong about the diagnosis, which he wasn't because I've seen the photos of the back of my eyes, which informed him and me because I'm quite knowledgeable in such areas myself. Yes, I agree. I'm going blind. Goodness. Anyway, a photo taken a year ago shows no such damage. It's gone. It's completely reversed. A thing that's medically impossible and could not possibly have occurred. Nonetheless, it did. So, um, yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd get in, into that. Absolutely. So this product releases your adult stem cells. That's our flagship product. This product here dissolves fibrin deposits out of your capillaries, allowing seed stem cells to get to where they need to go. Why do you get fibrin in your, in your vasculature? Well, it's an inflammatory process born of inappropriate chronic systemic inflammation, which is a result of modern lifestyles. Short-term inflammation indicated a good thing. Supposed to happen long-term. No, it ends up with your vessels being all plugged up with fibrin. This product dissolves it. Good. Um, this product here, which doesn't even look like that anymore because it's been, this has a new label. Um, that one is an anti-inflammatory. One of the biggest problems people have is inflammation. So that one deals with inflammation without the side effects of most anti-inflammatory prescription drugs. So that's great. There's one there if you're rheumatic or have joint issues. It's the same stuff with a different formulation, really, for all intents and purposes. And as you age, one of the things you also are unable to do is produce much collagen, which is the most important protein in your body. So I'd get that into you. Where do people go, Bob, to get this product? You must have a link. I do have a link and I, it's down in the description and I'll put it right here beneath my screen. It is semi-retired Bob slash Cerule. Right. Semi-retired Bob dot Cerule dot com is probably what it'll be, I would say. Yeah, it could be. I'm just saying that off the top of my head. I don't yeah, actually that, that'll be what it is. Yep. That's the format. So semi-retired Bob, semi-retired Bob, all one word dot cerule c-e-r-u-l-e spelt like can we see it on the box here there it is spelt like that c-e-r-u-l-e com i'd get into that i'd get into that today in fact i'd get into it yesterday um fantastic product absolutely uh, you know associated with see what i did there associated with a vast huge increase in my health status 13 years ago um, which thereby shows you that that was before I went carnival eight and a half years ago. So there's no crossover in terms of that. And then obviously when I went carnival, there was that much more benefit to be had again. 
So, yeah, I, absolutely, my professional opinion is absolutely warmly, strongly, I would get into this product as soon as possible or sooner. Um, I also took the product myself as a customer for 10 years before I even got involved in any kind of on, onward marketing and, and affiliate whatevers. So, um, yeah, I, that's how much I believed in it. I actually paid full retail for it for 10 years. By the way, you don't have to pay retail for it if you don't want to. You can join us as an affiliate marketer if you want to, in the same way that Bob has done to make some extra coin on the side if you want to. And if you want to talk about how that's done, it's not a sales job, by the way. We don't want salespeople. You'll just give us a bad name. Um, we just want people who will genuinely tell their story and talk about the stuff. If, if you feel like you, you could talk to people about how great this product is, let us know and we'll get you started if that's what you want to do. So if you want to make some money, there's an opportunity there as well. Right, that's it on Cerule, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, perhaps you could tell everyone where they can find you around social media. You bet. It's very, very easy to find me. If you bring up the search engine of your choice, punch in my name, B-A-R-T space K-A-Y, you will find me. I'll be the first 10 or 15 pages that come up on any search, on any search engine. You will find me. You will see me. If you want to go directly and find me on YouTube, it's just at Bart hyphen K-A-Y. If you want to find me on Instagram, it's Bart underscore K underscore nutrition. I also have a Twitter account, which is largely about swearing at and arguing with idiots for fun as kind of my release. Uh, don't take it too seriously. It's just a bit of fun. Uh, but a lot of people follow me there because they find it wildly amusing because I use lots and lots of very, very short words um, instead of the big ones I normally use when I'm talking about science. Mm. Excellent. I've also got a Facebook page. If you want to find me on Facebook, just search for me there. It's not hard. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I want to personally thank you for your time today, Professor, because I know your schedule is very busy. And on behalf of everyone that watches my channel, we would like to say thank you for taking time out of your day to talk with us today about very important topics. Just before you go, is there anything that you think, and we've already covered a great deal of this, that nutritional needs don't really change that much as you get older. Is there anything that you can think of that the older, I should say elder people in my group that, mm -hmm. that are following this way of life, is there any last thought you would have for them on things they might need to know? Yeah, look, first of all, let me respond to you thanking me by saying not at all. Thank you for the opportunity to cross-pollinate and to, and to be ever more visible on on the interwebs um it's, it's a great thing it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to share what i understand with folks for their ongoing benefit and i really really do wish all of you the absolute best in terms of what you need to know basically you want to consume a diet which consists of around about 1.75 grams of protein per kilogram of lean or ideal body mass which you can work out from your height using a BMI calculation, if you like, um, if you don't already know what your ideal sort of weight is. Then you would eat the rest of your diet to satiety in the form of largely saturated animal fat. That would predispose you to the best likelihood of the best longevity, health span for the remainder of your life that is possible. Um, I would absolutely, as I said, get into the Cerule product before yesterday, if I were you as well, to help support that situation. The other thing I would do is I would close my ears to all of these charlatans running around telling you you need balance, telling you you need plants in your diet, telling you that a meat-based diet will predispose you to heart disease or cancer, because all of those things are absolutely demonstrably not true. They are lies, absolute lies, with malice aforethought, actually. Most people repeating the lies actually believe the lies they are repeating. They, they're not evil people at large, but the people who are informing them in the first instance as to those lies really are genuinely evil people. And they need we need to shun them as we would spurn a rabid dog, frankly. 
Mm. They are the skunks of the nutrition science world. Get them out of here. Thanks, Bob. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming today, Professor. It has been wonderful. Don't forget to leave a comment down below thanking Professor K for being here today, folks. Have a great day. Mm. All right. See you later.